Hello, my name is Noel Kingsbury, and with my colleague Annie Gelfoyle, I run Garden Masterclass. Now, Annie and I started Garden Masterclass uh, six years ago to put on live educational events uh, in the British Isles. Uh, but with um, COVID, uh, the lockdown in April 2020, uh, we started doing a public service broadcast. Uh, and then we've settled down to running both live events, uh, but also with a big online content. So we do this Thursday Garden Chat once a week on a Thursday evening, six o'clock um, Western European time. And those recordings then go up on to uh, YouTube. Now, we also do webinars. We have a webinar season that runs through from September to May. We get leading experts globally uh, from the garden and landscape world to talk about their specialism. And of course, that's an opportunity uh, to ask them questions. Most of those webinars are recorded and are then available uh, through Vimeo from our website. Uh, we also put on courses. Uh, there's a course on naturalistic planting design, for example, which I do with uh, Professor Nigel Dunnett of the University of Sheffield in, in Northern England. Uh, and uh, we sometimes get involved in organizing conferences. Uh, we do all sorts of things that are aimed at encouraging quality planting, quality gardening, uh, knowledge about plants and botany, and plant science, and uh, we hope you'll you'll join us. Uh, we have a membership scheme which gives you discounts on our webinars and live events and various other goodies. Uh, and but also you can just sign up for our monthly email newsletter uh, to keep in touch with what we're doing. We believe and we've been told by many people that what we do is unique. It's unique in the range and quality of people we talk to and our global reach and our diversity. Uh, so I uh, hope you enjoy this particular episode and uh, do come back for more. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Hilary Cox and Neil DeBoll. Um, Neil is uh, something of a living legend in the prairie movement. Um, I think I probably first met him Oh, gosh, um, probably early 2000s. I've stayed with them, a couple, I think, two, maybe even three times in, in Wisconsin, having made the drive up from uh, from Chicago. Um, and uh, somebody who has always been uh, a, a, an extraordinarily powerful voice for prairie restoration and, and the use of, of prairie plants in, in gardens and designed landscapes. Um, and a man who is uh, terrifically good fun, and as he would probably also like us to point out, um, something of a pyromaniac, and no doubt he will tell us about that later. Now, um, some years ago, probably about 12 years ago, maybe even more, I was writing a book for Chicago University Press and working with a, a very good uh, editor, uh, Christy Henry, and... Um, I'm not quite sure how this transpired, but it turns out she was also working on a book that uh, Neil and Hillary were doing on prairie plants. Um, and I've probably sent a couple of encouraging emails to, to Neil and Hillary. I, I didn't know at the time. Anyway, um, probably probably 11 years ago, my book came out. <laughs> and Neil and Hillary's stayed in gestation for very much longer. Um, so... Uh, we're very glad indeed that it has finally come out. Um, and what a book. It has been worth the wait because anyone who knows me will know one of my sort of bees in my bonnet is just how poor the information is in a lot of garden books, particularly about perennials. Um, so wonderful to have a book that is so meticulous. There is so much information, stuff about longevity, uh, how plants spread, and this wonderfully cool thing, which I can well appreciate must have taken years to get together, is photographs of the plants as seedlings. And that is actually, I think, pretty much unique in any horticulture book. But of course, if you are growing prairies, prairie plants, mixtures of seed, uh, uh, then you it's actually really very very useful so congratulations uh, on producing that book um at uh, university of chicago, chicago press um and that's the kind of hook really on which we're hanging tonight's um session 
Anyway, uh, Neil, I've sort of occasionally kept up with uh, over the years. We sent each other sort of have sent each other quite entertaining emails about the dire political events that have been um, tormenting both our countries. Um, and um, it was nice to meet Hillary. Hillary um, is British by origin, as you'll soon hear. So I think, Hillary, let's start with you and how you got into plants and gardens. I think the best way to explain it is that we bought a house um, in outside of Stevenage in Hertfordshire, mm. where the previous owner had been the head gardener at the manor house in Walken. And we inherited this garden. I was young. I didn't have much experience. And he had grown a garden that an experienced gardener would grow. I sat looking at the ground that first spring and thinking, what is that? I have no clue what that is. So having been a librarian, I immediately went to the library to see if there was a book that would show me what these plants coming through the ground were. Later on, I went looking for a book that would show me the leaves because these things were still not flowering. So again, there was no such book. And until Niels and my book came out, um, there still was no such book that showed the leaves, that showed the seedlings, that showed the plant coming through the ground, the mature plant. So um, eventually we ended up in Delaware and that was when I first encountered prairie plants because some of the prairie plants are also in the northeast of the states. And I found that they survived a lot better than some of the plants that I was growing back in England, like delphiniums. You can't grow delphiniums in Delaware unless you know how. And I never found out how. Then we moved to Indiana, and of course, um, in the northwest of the state is prairie. Most of the state was eastern forest, but the western, northwestern part was actually prairie. And I became involved through the Nature Conservancy in the Kankakee Sands um, restoration. And then a client of mine, by this time I was designing gardens, for people, they wanted English gardens. I knew that prairie plants survived. And so, of course, I got in contact with Neil and he has been my mentor and my collaborator ever since that time. Well, on the, uh, on the subject of Delphiniums. Um, I was once told authoritatively by the late um, um, Hein um, Kenneth Lawrence and uh, Alnarp in Sweden that the best place to grow delphiniums is at the Arctic Circle. <laughs> um, if you think about it, their maximum period of growth is May, June, July, which is when the sun is continually in the sky. Yes. Uh, and they are from you know Russia, fairly high latitudes anyway. So um, that's where to go to grow the. And there probably aren't any slugs in the Arctic Circle either. Um, so true. Yeah. Um, you then became basically thoroughly immersed in in, in North American flora. I did, and um, I started to go and look for the plants that I knew were native to the area in their natural habitat. And the more I saw of those plants in their natural habitats, the more that influenced my designs for my gardens, for my clients, even though they still were asking for English gardens, cottage gardens, I was incorporating um, the native plants. I'm also um, as expert in um, woodland plants as in prairie plants. And seeing as there's a lot of woodland in central Indiana, I was mixing the two. Um, and my clients didn't even need to know if they didn't want to that uh, these plants were native plants. 
I already knew that they were better for the environment, they were better for the wildlife. So may I ask when, when this was, when you were designing gardens, and by the sound of it, surreptitiously sneaking in the natives? I started in 1993, mm. and my swan song was in 2014, when um, the Perennial Plant Association came up from a Cincinnati conference and um, came to see one of my formal gardens using native plants and then my prairie, which is mm. um, one of the pictures that will come up. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, 1993 was um, more or less, I think, the first time I ever went to the United States. And I was actually researching a book on, on wildflowers, which had for the garden, which had to be a very general book. Uh, and so I was very much consciously looking out for places that were growing wildflowers. But my overall impression of driving down the East Coast was that you know everyone had a, law, a lawn yeah. within a few inches of its life. And if there were any perennials, it would be like one square metre bed of bright pink flocks. Nothing else, bright pink flocks. The only people who grew wildflowers were in sort of places like Garden in the Woods in, in Massachusetts. Or I remember Bowman's Hill, Bowman's Preserve in Pennsylvania and a few other places, um, and I suppose kind of weird hippies like like, like Neil probably was at the time. Um, so, uh, and you know, these decades later, my God, what an incredible change there's been. Um, I mean, when you were having those dialogues with clients in the nineties, uh, did you encounter opposition? Were people a bit sort of uh, suspicious sometimes of what you were planting? No, they actually believed me, yeah, which. Right. <laughs> because I actually grew all of those plants in my own garden first. Mm, mm, mm. And I could show them three, four years of growth on these plants in my own garden. Mm. So um, that I would take them on a tour of my garden and say, this is appropriate for what you have in this situation. And they believe me. Mm, mm. Yes, and uh, so getting getting plants must have been a dip, must have been a problem. And how did you get plants for plants' gardens? By word of mouth, mm -hmm. I never advertised, and because my plants tended to have a high survival rate mm -hmm. and longevity, which you're interested in, yes, um, yes. then they they would pass on the word that um, yes, this yes. was somebody who knew what they were doing. And and you were growing a lot of them yourself for the, for the I grew the all of them before you I kind ever... of had to, I suppose. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, I yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in Indiana, of course, it can get down to minus twenty five Fahrenheit yes. in mm -hmm. winter, and so you have to have the plants that are tough and survive yeah, in those situations. Yes, yes. Um, now, from the photos, it's obvious you have a, a disability. Um, yes. How has that, I mean, that must have made things, you know, a bit difficult, botanizing, which often requires, you know, quite a lot of um, physical activity. Um, that must have been a challenge. Actually, not really, um, because my mother had brought me up to do everything that the whole family did. We went camping. I think I was eight or nine when I climbed my first mountain in Scotland. And um, from anything as mundane as setting the table at home to climbing that mountain in Scotland, mum mm -hmm. encouraged me to do yeah, just yeah. the same as everybody else. Yes, yes, great, great. Um, and when did you first meet Neil? That was in 1993, literally. Oh, um, okay. Yes. And I had met you that year too, but you were up in um, northern Indiana with Cole Burrell. Oh gosh, yes, gosh, I remember. Yes, they, they were at um, oh um, Notre Dame. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, so, I'm trying to pronounce it the American way, as opposed to going Notre Dame. <laughs> yes, Notre <laughs> Dame. Um, yes, but oh, then... gosh, I remember that. That was that was a mad tour. That was well, we thought it was mad anyway. On a plane one day, lecturing the next. Next, yes. Complaining about yeah. getting at four o'clock in the morning and all the rest of it. And on and on, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, what happened then was that Neil came to be the first speaker at the first annual conference for mm. the Indiana Native Plant Society. Yeah. And he and I got talking. 
And then um, I got a client who wanted to do bioremediation of Brownfield. He, his office was on an old coal yard. Mm -hmm. And my mandate was to invite as many creatures from the canal which ran close by right up to his window mm -hmm. using prairie plants. So, mm -hmm. of course, I called Neil. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, we worked together from then. Yeah, right. Okay, great. Great. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Hilary. Um, now, Neil, can we bring you on board? We're good to go. Neil, hello. Aha, so you've organized yourself a good good backdrop there. Great, haven't seen you for a few years. How are you? Doing well, and you? Uh, I'm fine, thanks. Yes, living in Portugal now, um, coping with a different climate, which is interesting. We've just got back home to have had some nice rain, so um, the gardening year can now can now begin. So great. Now, um, tell me, how did you get started? Not even so much with prairie plants, but the whole business of growing and plants and gardens and landscape and what got you well, into it? I'll try and give you the short version. Um, I was brought up by nature loving parents, both educators, and we would go hiking, backpacking, etc. And they always loved flowers. So I grew up in Missouri in the central part of the United States and the Ozarks in the southern part of the state have some wonderful wildflowers and natural ecosystems. And my mother's family's from Colorado, western Colorado, and we would of course go hiking in the mountains where there are wonderful meadows. So that was the start. And then I was involved in the first Earth Day in the United States in 1970 when I was 16 years old. I was you know, very tuned into the environment. And so I was a uh, tree hugging dirt worshiper from early on. Um, and I really wanted to, to help the environment. Thought I was going to save the world. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. Can't do that. But we can all put in our, our little bit yeah. to help. So um, I thought I was going to be an environmental engineer and use science to improve systems. But I soon discovered that calculus was not my favorite subject. So I moved on to uh, botany and ecology. And I took a course from a professor uh, who said, someone should study the newly seeded prairies on the Arboretum. And I was involved in the setup of this Arboretum at the university I went to because it was a new school. And um, I just started studying prairies and it just grabbed me. And that was it. And that was 45 years ago. Mm, so mm. that, um, that kind of set the tone. And then I graduated from college tried a bunch of different jobs and I was ready to do something more substantial. I was 28. It was a recession of 1981, 82. There were no jobs. So what do you do when you can't find a job? You create your own job. So actually I did not start Prairie Nursery. It was a backyard hobby gardens started by a gentleman named Bob Smith. Um, I was a customer of his because I purchased seed for restorations at the University of Arboretum, which I was not, at that time was managing. And so he uh, retired at age 68 and I called him up and said, Bob, um, you think you would be willing to sell your plants and I could move them up here? I lived in Green Bay at that time, Green Bay, Wisconsin. He lived two hours to in central Wisconsin. And he said, well, I suppose, but maybe you'd want to come down here and run the nursery. So I thought, oh, my God, where is this town, Westfield? Never been there. So <laughs> I went down and looked at it. Bob and I hit it off. Um, I bought a cheap old trailer. I swore I'd never live in a trailer. I'd live in a tent, but not a trailer. Uh, but we didn't have any money. I had a, a business partner at that time. And so uh, we bought this trailer, moved down there and set up shop. And that was in 1982. And the rest is history. So mm -hmm. we've grown the nursery from a half acre little plot to multiple greenhouses. And, uh, it's really, uh, it's a going concern. And uh, we ship hundreds of thousands of plants a year to customers who want to restore the, restore the ecology of their homes and businesses and parks etc and we also ship a lot of seed as well so getting hold of plants and seed must have been pretty difficult in those early years and if they weren't actually part of the stock of the yeah. nursery took over i mean how did you how, how and where did you find uh, seed and plants the first three four or five years it was basically a hunter gather seed economy <laughs> and i would go out on 
little back roads and railroad tracks and any place there was a little prairie room and, and collect the seeds and was able to assemble quite a number of species. Mm-hmm. Now, Bob had some species already there, but we expanded upon mm-hmm. that and mm-hmm. wanted to uh, broaden the gene pool as well with other populations. Yeah, so it yeah. was really though, we would go out in the fall and hand collect seed until we could do establish some larger fields that could be mechanically harvested. So it was yeah. very, very hand to mouth subsistence. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally, literally hunter gather economy. So it was a very, very um, difficult start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when did you feel that really not just you had turned a corner as a business, but perhaps also the prairie movement as a whole had turned a corner? When was the sort of, when do you think that was? Um, you know, it's really interesting. Things really started to change in the late 80s. And we had a very significant drought in the Midwest in 1988. Mm-hmm. And traditional gardens just literally just melted and burned up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But people that had prairie gardens, they just mostly powered right through it. Now, some plants will go dormant. Some prairie plants will go dormant under stream heat and drought. But most of them just continue on. And this mm-hmm. made a really big impression on people. And it was it was noted by you know various publications. So mm-hmm. I think that really helped people understand the uh, applicability. And uh, in the 90s, things really started to take off. Mm-hmm. So, so that was, the 90s were a very good uh, decade for people that were really starting to appreciate native plants. And of course it's, it's continued to grow. Yeah. yeah. It's continued to grow. And I think the really, the hugest factor has been the new focus in the last three to five years on pollinators. Yes. The, yes. Fact, the fact that you have these um, often not always obligate, but in many cases, very close ties between individual pollinators and certain species or families mm-hmm. and, and just pollinators in general and the utilization of larva, of nectar sources, et cetera, by mm. native invertebrates, pollinators, et cetera, compared to non-native plants where they haven't developed these relationships over yeah. mm-hmm. thousands or millions of years. And so people are understanding that and really taking it very, very seriously. And that's been a great yeah. boon for for building a native plant uh, movement. And I th- another thing I think should really be mentioned is Professor Doug Tallamy at the University of Delaware who published Bringing Nature Home, which really provided scientific evidence of a link between native plants and native butterflies, moths, pollinators, et cetera. And that was incredibly valuable. He proved what a lot of us kind of thought, but couldn't prove. He actually provided the data. Right. And that was, yeah. that was 17 years ago. And uh, it's really had a tremendous impact. Bringing yeah. Nature Home by Douglas yeah. Tellamy, amazing yeah. book. And he's yeah. published a couple more books since then as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, because I think I first met you in Germany. Um, and um, there was a sort of late 90s, there began to be quite a bit of interest in prairie in both Germany and, and in Britain, which uh, to you must have seemed a little bit kind of weird. Um, and um, yeah, you took it all in good heart and I... I imagine you probably understood the reasons why, you know, there the were reasons why, the good reasons actually for for, for that interest. Um, but it must have seemed a bit odd, you know, what were all these, you know, uh, Europe, North and Central Europeans getting so excited I, about on the floor, or especially in, in light of what you've just said. Right. Well, as a native plant enthusiast and a firm believer in native plants being, in most cases, um, so how shall we say, uh, the best fit from an environmental and ecological standpoint in any given region, it seemed very odd to me that these would be a choice in England, Germany, UK, whatever, because they were so out of place in in ecological sense. But knowing the culture and history of England and Germany, I completely understood the the fascination. And I mean, England, my God, what plants don't you grow there that don't, except for things that can't, you know, <laughs> need warmer temperatures, et cetera. But I mean, the, the long history of horticulture in England is astounding. And I think in Germany too, there's this tremendous interest in nature and diversity of 
of landscapes. So it, it made sense from a horticultural standpoint, but not necessarily from an ecological standpoint. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an odd thing. I mean, one of the, one of the things I found really in, intriguing is this kind of mystery as to why certain regions develop certain floras. Like you know, in the United States, well, in North America, you have this incredibly diverse flora for, you know, pretty high resource, uh, averagely moist soils uh, that flowers late season. In Europe, we have an extremely limited flora f- f- for that. And you kind of wonder, until people came along with North American perennials, what the butterflies and bees fed on in, you know, come come September. Um, and of course, our strong point in Europe is this amazing limestone flora. You know, like if we have a post-industrial site full of just kind of crunched up concrete, we don't worry. We just grow our native European limestone flora and we wait for the orchids to come pouring in. Um, and I just feel sometimes sorry for North American practitioners dealing with kind of post-industrial sites because you you don't seem to have anything like the same flora for, you know, just kind of crushed concrete. Actually, we have what are called dry lime prairies, which are mm. on limestone and dolomite, where mm. the pH can be as high as 8.2. Mm-hmm. And even higher, the average pH of our dry line prairies in the upper Midwest the United States is 8.2. Mm-hmm. So there are plants that we have used in exactly situations, but not so much in concrete, but in, in concrete mixed soil and also yeah. in, in um, uh, re- uh, mitigation where mm-hmm. you have industrial waste, where you have pHs even higher, 8.5 or higher. So there are right. species that will grow in those conditions. I mean, it's, it's not like we have uh, a burren like in West in County Clare in Western mm-hmm. Ireland yeah, yeah. and some of the other, but we do have those those situations and there are plants. Neil, that um, the that. Barrens in Kentucky in the Karst region that's all limestone. That those plants that do really well on limestone mm-hmm. survive mm-hmm. on rock. Yeah, yeah, and is that is that quite a a, a diverse flora? Very diverse, yeah, and a lot of it, yeah, very mm-hmm. rare now. Yes, yes, yes. And there are regions of Alva, aren't there, around the Great Lakes? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just in terms of unpacking the word prairie a little bit for, yeah, particularly for a non North American um, listeners, um, you know, we. And we've always had a bit of a problem with the word prairie in 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 British, in, certainly in British English, because it was initially used almost as a term of abuse for uh, uh, massive agricultural fields. You know, a great big field of wheat without any hedgerows would be described as oh, it's like a prairie. Um, so there had to be quite a kind of shift, and there had to be quite a bit kind of rebranding of of, of prairie, uh, at least for. A, a British audience, um, different, I think, in, in, in Germany and other countries. Um, but it's still quite, uh, it's like the um, garden press and the garden centre center industry have sort of at least now associated prairie to some extent with late season perennials. And uh, uh, the word still gets to be abused, but at least it is associated now with flowers as opposed to fields of wheat, which is some sort of linguistic progress i suppose i suppose um but i mean how would you uh d- perhaps do a sort of basic differentiation of basic prairie types for a for a for for, for those of us on this side of the pond well um can i address that yeah okay um if you look at the origin of the term north american prairie it was coined by early french explorers in the 17th century as they entered into the Midwest, mostly fur trappers who were dealing with Native American populations and trading with them. And they came upon these huge expanses of grasslands in the central United States. And in French, the word prairie means meadow. And so that's what they named the prairie. Now, interestingly, in the United States, the term prairie and meadow generally mean very different things. When people think of a meadow, they usually think of a lower growing grassland dominated by cool season grasses, Mm -hmm. mostly in the eastern, northeastern United States, where you have higher rainfall and you don't have the same development of prairies. There are small prairie remnants located in Virginia and Pennsylvania, Connecticut, et cetera, in the northeast. But they're really not uh, extensive. But when you get into the Midwest, where it is hotter, drier, and 
le far less trees, and that was largely due to management pra uh, management practices by Native Americans to keep the prairie open for better hunting of large game like bison, elk, etc. So they enforced the grassland by basically burning out the trees. But the prairie has come to mean a taller grassland generally dominated by warm season grasses, although there are cool season grasses and sedges in the Midwestern prairie and prairies. Remember the prairie stretched from Manitoba in Southern Canada down into Texas. So it covered a lot, a lot of territory and from parts of Ohio all the way into to the Rocky Mountains. Now there are different types of prairie. There's the Eastern tall grass prairie, which focuses on our book. There I am in my, uh, my burning garb, but, uh, but the Eastern tall grass prairie has uh, obviously, as its name in, implies, mostly taller plants because you have higher rainfall. Then you get over to the west and to the near the Rocky Mountains and you have the short grass prairie because it is eight to 15 inches of rain a year versus 30 to 45 inches of rain in the eastern tall grass prairie. So they only support shorter grasses and forbs. And then you have the mixed grass prairie, which is a zone of transition between the tall grass prairie to the east and the short grass prairie to the west. And so you'll have combinations of various species uh, in a mix in that transition zone of the mid grass. Uh, of the mixed grass prairie. So mm -hmm. that hopefully that gives you some idea of the terminology yeah. Yeah. and the different ecosystems. And is is the role of uh, fire important in, in all of them? It's essential. Mm. It's really important. Uh, fire, of course, the prairie evolved under the influence of fire, helping to keep out woody plants and also to clear the debris from the previous growing season to warm up the soil, which favors the primarily warm season prairie flowers and grasses. They're not all warm season, some are cool season, but mostly the prairies were burned in the fall by native people for a variety of reasons. One, when you burn in the fall, you have exposed the soil, which then allows green up to be much earlier in spring, which then attracts uh, ungulates that you can hunt for food. And there's a big difference. If you can start hunting in March, or early April, as opposed to May, you can have food after winter, large animals, big, big hunks of meat a month earlier. And if you're running short on food, that can make the difference between life and death. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if you were traveling in the winter, the debris from the prairie tends to catch snow. And by burning it off, the wind, if there's wind associated with a snow event, will blow it off of the ridges so it's easier to, to walk in the winter. Oh, so there are a number of different reasons. And of course, it, it burn, burns back woody plants to keep it open because if you look at what wildlife grows in a forest, you don't really get a lot of bison, elk, et cetera, much smaller animals, squirrels, birds, et cetera, which are much less efficient from a hunting standpoint. So it was really a, an econ economic land management decision to burn the prairies by native peoples. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in terms of managing a sort of more domestic or designed landscape prairies, uh, I imagine this is a, a difficult tool to to to, to use. Uh, and how well can you manage without burning? Well, you can substitute mowing and raking mm -hmm. for burning and mowing right down to the ground. And the biggest issues that we have in managing prairies in the Midwest and the East is invasion by woody plants and cool season non-native weeds and grasses. And because most of the prairie plants are warm season, what we often will do is we will burn in mid-spring after the cool season weeds and grasses have emerged and hopefully when the woody plants have leafed out because you can do maximum damage to them at that time after they begin spring growth. And you also turn the soil black, which then absorbs the sunlight much more readily than the debris, which reflects the sunlight of the previous year's growth. So burning sets back the unwanted woody plants, cool season weeds and grasses, and mm. blackens the soil. So the temperature rises very rapidly. In fact, some studies I did showed that burning on May 1st in Northeastern Wisconsin led to an increase in soil temperature of 10 degrees centigrade in four days of sunny weather following yeah. the burn That's yeah. very, in the, in the top, inch, top inch of soil. Yeah. That's a yeah. very significant increase yeah. in temperature. Mm -hmm. which then favors the, the warm season prairie flowers and grasses over the cool yes. season invaders. So by mowing and raking at approximately the same time, you want to mow as closely as possible, which mimics the effects of burn by removing the new mm -hmm. growth 
of the unwanted species. And by raking, you expose the soil so it warms up. It's, it's about 50 to 60 percent as effective as burning, but it can it really can make a huge difference. So for yeah. people that can't burn, and that often happens in urban areas, or yeah. people that don't, have, they maybe have a, a small prairie or it's too close to the house, you can just substitute blowing yeah. and raking. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of the plants you sell, um, are they all original species or, and because I know this had been this debate about so-called native Rs, and there's that inevitable tendency of the horticultural industry uh, to really distort plant genetics. Now, I thought it was interesting, you've got this backdrop, you've, you've included some echinaceas, and of course echinaceas have become this great sort of poster boy for the native plant movement. But at the same time, breeders have got a hold of them and are you know, churning out... You know, always kind of hideous varieties. Um, yes. which I'm sure you disapprove of. Um, and, um, but uh, are there circumstances in which having a cultivar of a native plant is actually useful, or do you think would you rather just see genetic diversity full stop? Well, I'll be honest with you, Noel. I was seduced by the variation of the various plants in my production fields in the 1990s, mm. and I had a pretty significant uh, display garden where I had all this different variety that just occurred from growing the plants by seed. Yeah, yeah. And so I started selecting all these native R's back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And then I realized in the early 2000s, you know, this is really not what we do. We're into genetic diversity. Yes. So yes. I, basically, I basically abandoned the whole thing. And I had various people from Holland saying, oh, we'll make you millions of dollars. Send us these plants. We'll propagate them. And I, I didn't do that because really our whole mission is to yeah, preserve yeah. as much genetic diversity as, as possible. So, and you'll notice also that Doug Tallamy's and his grad, graduate students have done studies of the effectiveness of many cultivar, I mean, excuse me, many native R's of native plants as far as providing nectar, pollen, et cetera, for native insects. And the vast majority of the native R's are inferior to the open pollinated wild type, with a couple of exceptions. Very but, interesting. Oh, very interesting. Mm, mm. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's the yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. There's also there's a study that the RHS funded a while ago. I think they were looking at primulas, and they found that there was a. a they found that cultivars that, or, or seed strains that had larger flowers, which of course the, the seed industry likes to produce things with larger flowers. And with primulas, this is just getting ridiculous and they're just getting bigger and bigger. And every year, every January, you know, your local filling station, the polyanthus appear. Every year the flowers are kind of bigger and bigger. There was the plants with larger flower sizes were simply less drought tolerant. They were they were less resilient. Yeah. So there seems to be this real trade-off. Uh, so I thought that was, that was a interesting support for that so but in terms of how you how you sell plants how you market plants i mean initially you did seed then you're doing plants and seed um and you're now selling kind of collections of plants i i i see from the website oh plant gardens collections yes yeah, yeah. yes oh yes we, we've been doing that for my goodness um 30 something years 35 yeah. years well, you have as yeah. long as that yeah 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 yeah, one of our strategies was we have to make, uh, we have to present prairie plants in a fashion that is acceptable to the gardening public. Mm -hmm. So two, I would say two of the innovations that Prairie Nursery did in the 1980s, mid 80s, was to create plant collections, pre-designed -pre gardens, so people don't have to figure out where all the plants go. We do that for them. So you associate mm -hmm. the plants in a format that is acceptable to the average perennial gardener. Yeah, 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 yeah. Secondarily, when I first started doing this, a prairie seed mix was just a kitchen sink mix of tall prairie grasses and fl flowers and short grasses and flowers. Well, people would say, I don't want eight foot tall, big blue stem, Andropogon gardii, in mm. my front yard. I want something that's, you know, three feet, maybe four feet tall. So I said, hey, we can do that. So I designed seed mixes that had short prairie grasses and flowers. Right, right, right. And at the time, I took some criticism because people said, well, that's not a real prairie. And I said, well, it, it has 25, 30 species, and the ecological niches of a grassland are being filled. It's just not the traditional, you know, prairie yeah. that you might hear in Wisconsin yeah. or Minnesota yeah. Yeah. or yeah. Illinois, yeah. but it's purely functional and yeah. uh, ecologically sound. So, mm -hmm. and that soon, be, that soon became very acceptable and was yes. copied. 
So now tell me about the book. How did the, um, the, the idea for the book and the collaboration on the book come about? <laughs> this is all Hillary's fault. <laughs> it is. This was because that book didn't exist, the one that showed plants coming through the ground and it didn't show leaves and very few. I mean, you get books that show all the flowers, but they don't show any other part of the plant. And um, by the time I was in Indiana and in contact with Neil, I realized that he had all of the access to these plants. Um, if I couldn't find them in Indiana, I could go up to Wisconsin because he'd have them in the nursery. And uh, that was exactly what I did. So um, I asked him if he would join me. I'd been rejected by multiple presses by then. And I thought, well, maybe if Neil would join me in doing this, um, somebody would accept us. And they did. Mm -hmm. Neil? Yep. <laughs> when, when Hillary approached me with this concept, she was frustrated because her clients were pulling out her prairie plants in the garden she designed and planted for them because they thought they were weeds and they didn't recognize them. She says, Neil, we've got to do a book that shows prairie plants emerging in spring so, my, so people know what they look like. And I said, Hillary, who in the heck is going to buy that book? Ten of our closest friends? <laughs> no, that's that's crazy. So of course we embarked on this absurd mission, and that's when we decided, oh, we better start adding the leaves. Well, you know, if it's going to be a plant book, it's got to have the flowers. You know, we should show the whole plant. Oh, you know, another thing that people like to know is what do the seeds look like. So when we we were taking photos of the seed heads, and the seed heads can vary in their appearance when they are mature from when they are immature so then for many species we had what we call early seed or immature seed and mature seed and of course everybody wants to know what the seedling looks like so then we had to take seedling photos so the upshot of this was after 22 years we finally had a book uh, well yeah and and uh yeah what a what, what a what a what a book it is too um and opening up on this sh shot of the pulsatilla um, I think now classified as an anemone. A reminder, I think that uh, you know the prairies have a wonderfully rich spring spring flora. It's not all just kind of late tall stuff. Um, and of course, thanks very much, I think, to Christy Henry at the um, University of Chicago Press, who I think I like to think of somebody who recognizes a good idea when it comes along. Um, yeah, and perhaps could you tell us? Could you tell us a little bit about some more about the the kind of information you've included in the book. Hillary, you want to do that? Um, apart from the plant profiles, mm. um, with all of these pictures, we have covered also the food web, and so um, descriptions and pictures of the creatures that might come by and visit your prairie plants or your prairie if you actually have a prairie. Um, so snakes, of course, this was something I encountered when I was installing prairies in residential areas. Um, I would have to go around to the neighbors and do PR and explain that um, snakes don't like lawns. Mm -hmm. And rats don't like tall grass. So the snakes weren't going to come and get their rats from the neighboring residential area. They were probably going to stay in the taller grass area. Not always, but, you know, that was at least a PR point that I could make for them. Mm -hmm. Um the insects, of course, the pollinators, the birds that come in just because you have the insects and the seeds that they need. Another chapter that we have is that you've seen the pictures of Neil setting fire to things. That's actually at his own prairie at home. Um, and it's vital to get people to understand the use of fire, but at the same time, 
to understand how dangerous it is. So um, that chapter covers everything about how to do it safely and how to go ahead and have fun with fire. Um, we're both a bit of a pyromaniac. I've been at Neil's when he's had his um, Thanksgiving, not Thanksgiving, what was it, Neil, the Halloween parties where he would have gathered material for a couple of years and then it would be there in, in that yard of his, which you've seen, and he would set fire to the whole thing. That's um, just a Talking wonderful tree. Talking yep. trees, shrubs, you know, a big bonfire. Yep. Yeah. Your ramness remains. So um, other than that, we have the tables. Yes. And Neil, I think um, you could probably describe the tables because they're just, I mean, everything that you need to know about a plant, the spacing in a garden or the spacing in a prairie the spacing for plants of certain sizes and then the number of seeds that you need per square foot or whatever. If you want to know, does it make a good cup flower? We include that. What does it attract in the way of wildlife and um, as a host um, for insects, for their larvae? Um, you can find that in those tables. I mean, there. I don't think, Neil, is there anything we didn't cover in those tables? Um, it really is. It really is fantastically co co comprehensive, um, and um, we haven't got any questions coming in. If anyone's got any questions, do please send them in on the chat. Um, I'd just like love to flag up actually something. Uh, particularly for you, Neil, you may remember I brought a, an Argentinian colleague, Amalia Robredo, round to you in Wisconsin, who probably, I don't know, around about 2010 or something, perhaps. Yeah, um, I, I remember her very, very, yes, yeah. very fun. Yeah. Amalia, Amalia went on to uh, do a lot of really good work in Argentina and Uruguay and helped really uh, kickstart a real interest in using native plants there. Um, and she was then contacted by um, a lady in Brasilia, Mariana Cicada, who work, was working with ecologists in a savanna landscape with an incredibly rich herbaceous flora. Um, anyway, we had some Brazilians in on one of the online courses I do, um, and then Amalia would start going over to, to Mariana's flying up to Brasilia once a month for about a year to help with mentoring and training the Brazilians. Um, and it was wonderful to go to a conference in Germany the other last just a, about a month ago and have Mariana talking to us about uh, this amazing flora in southern Brazil and how they're be beginning to use that in public squares in Brasilia as well as uh, as well as private garden projects. So um, you know there's this wonderful chain of inspiration and, and, and mentoring you've you've been part of. That's, I was so impressed with with her and the work that she does. Yeah. And I'm certainly hoping that in Argentina and Brazil and Uruguay, that they do a better job of preserving their grasslands than we did mm. in the United States. Because yes, if you look yes. at the eastern tall grass prairie, there is less than one tenth of one percent of that remaining. It was essentially yes. completely plowed up for agriculture yes, in the yes. 19th century and early 20th century. There's yes, very yes. little left there. A lot of remnants now are being invaded by woody plants, and so we, we continue to lose them to development mm -hmm. and to woody invasion. So, yeah, and, and yeah. And fire. So they have a great opportunity to preserve yeah. more than, than yeah. we did here. Yeah. Now, people are are reestablishing prairies and other native landscapes, but you know, it's seldom the same as the original. It's seldom as diverse, yes. and there are many species, especially the early spring species, that are produce very small quantities of seed, are very difficult to collect, and are not generally available for restoration purposes. Right, yes. So so, so the the prairie flora we have commercially available is quite sort of rear-ended, if you like. It very much focuses on the you know, asteraceae that set tons of seed that germinates, you know, easily and all the rest of it. And yeah, it. and the, the ones that are more difficult to produce and propagate tend not to be available. 
And honestly, yeah, yeah. Um, there, there are some that are not particularly showy, so people generally don't want those, and so they don't yeah, include yeah. them in their gardens or their restorations, even though they may be ecologically significant for some yes. species. Yes, they, um, yes. they are commonly not used just because they don't provide the show that people want. Yep, yeah, 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 yeah. No, so... Yeah, I, I, I could um, mention some other aspects of the book if that would be helpful. Noel. Yeah, please do. Yes, yes. No, it's okay. such a fun story. So if you look at the different chapters, they include the history and ecology of the prairie, which is a, a short description of the evolution of the prairie over the last 25 million years or so, mm -hmm. and how it developed, and the rise of ungulates with the rise of grasslands. With It was due to the uh, rise of the Rocky Mountains, creation of, of a rain shadow in the west, and that led to a a rather symbiotic relationship between grasslands and and large large grazers and then we go into a topic that is so important but oftentimes neglected is understanding your soil so people need to know what is their soil type and so we wanted to make sure that people were aware of how to evaluate your soil so you can select the plants that truly match your growing conditions then designing planting and maintaining prairie gardens which is a big big part of the book because it is the gardener's guide. So we go into details about prairie gardens and, and the difference between a prairie garden and a, and a general perennial garden. And that difference is, whether it's a prairie meadow or a prairie garden, is that they have a grass component. Most perennial gardens, at least historically, until recently, have not co uh, contained or included a significant grass component. That is that is certainly changing. But a prairie is a grassland. And so it's important that you include the grasses in the garden. And the the purpose of the grasses or the role of the grasses is multiple. First of all, most of the flowers are blooming spring, summer, fall, and by October, most of them are done. I and mean, that's when the grasses really take over and put on the show. The warm season grasses carry the show October, November, December into the winter. So it gives you a four season landscape. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the, the grasses also, because of their fibrous root systems, help occupy the surface soil and squeeze out weeds. And thirdly, they also absorb a lot of nitrogen, which keeps your, your flowers from getting long and leggy. Mm -hmm. So they do they provide many services uh, mm -hmm. ecologically and, and functionality from a garden standpoint. And here is really interesting. If you tour American gardens versus touring English gardens, and I tell people in America, you ever, have you ever gone to England and looked at English gardens? How much mulch do they use? English gardeners don't use mulch, they use plants. They're, they are assessed. They are planting the plants so that the, the root systems and the foliar shading controls the weeds for, for the most part. In America, most, most gardens are just a big mulch pile with a few plants stuck in them. Now, that, I'm being a little extreme, but that is very common if you look at the typical American garden if it's not put together by a real gardener. And you don't have the same level of gardening know-how or, or rabid interest as you do in the U.K., so it's, or, or Germany or wherever. So you have people that are just using mulch as a weed barrier, if you will, and cramming a few perennials here and there. So this whole concept of using the plants to control the weeds is really a very English concept, even though all we're doing is copying the ecology of a prairie. But mm -hmm. English gardeners figured that out centuries ago. So uh, you know, I have to say that I absolutely hated grasses when I was growing them in England. And it was only through all of this experience over the past 30 years of working with native plants and driving across the United States at least twice a year, as I ended up doing, and seeing the prairie grasses come into their own later in the year mm -hmm. that I grew to understand and love those grasses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, a couple other highlights of the book. Um, there's a chapter on establishing a successful prairie meadow from seeds, which is a fairly complex process. And you have to get every step of it right, or, or there's a danger of failure. So it's very specific on the, on the procedures. And then as Hillary mentioned, burning your prairie safely and hopefully having fun. <laughs> and then there's, cha there's a chapter on propagating prairie plants from seed and propagating prairie plants vegetatively. So... Um, that's really the gist of the book, and Hillary was alluding to the oh, the attraction of wildlife 
pollinators, etc. We included hummingbirds, songbirds, game birds, bees and bumblebees, butterflies, moths, predaceous wasps, parasitic wasps, pollinating flies, and beetles. So we wanted to be as thorough as possible to provide people with that information. What about buffaloes? Sorry? What about buffaloes and bears? Yep, um, buffaloes. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> Well, we think we thought the average gardener would not actually have the opportunity to do that. But there's the buffalo. <laughs> right. But, it did yeah, actually play uh, a pretty important role in the ecology, didn't they? I think uh, we had yes. one very specific question in about uh, what would you do about um, com compacted soil? Well, there are a couple of ways to handle that. Um, it depends upon how deep the compaction is, but. Um, I'll tell you what we do if we have the option. We go in there with a big tractor-mounted rototiller, rotivator, and chop it up. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then add organic matter. And a really, really good method. It really is important to break up hard pan. You can't just throw organic matter on top and hope that's going to change. You nearly need to break through that. Once mm -hmm. you've done that, then you can plant. And I've I've used this on on very heavy clay subsoils, where you can plant. Uh, basically green manures where you would plant mm -hmm. buckwheat after the danger of frost and usually buckwheat grows about two to two and a half months and it flowers. Bees love it. So you wait until and it it's makes just... the best honey. Buckwheat. Have you, ever, you know, have you had, ever had buckwheat honey? Yes, I have. It's like molasses. It's amazing <laughs> stuff. Whenever I go to Poland, I make sure I come back with jars of buckwheat honey. It just, it's, you know, the honey, it's, not everyone likes it, but it's, it's honey to end all honeys. It's one of the darkest honeys I've ever, ever seen. It's pretty amazing. I'm sure it's yeah. very extremely nutritious. But yeah. um, so you cut down the buckwheat before it goes to seed. If you don't cut it down before it goes to seed, you will have buckwheat for some time to come. And then you, <laughs> you till that into the soil. And this is usually, if you plant it in June, uh, usually you'll be tilling it under in mid-August, late August. And then you plant a crop of winter wheat or winter rye in, in early September, depending on your locale. And then that grows over the winter into the spring. And this is completely organic. You're using no herbicides whatsoever. Then in spring, usually late May, early June, you cut that down before it heads out into seed. And then you till that in as a green manure. And then you plant another crop of buckwheat. And you may be ready to seed in the fall, or you may want to plant one more crop of winter wheat or winter rye in September, and then plant the following spring. Usually two years can make a tremendous difference in the organic matter content of the soil. And you're not robbing a peat bog to add organic matter or mm -hmm. using vast quantities of, of compost at a very high price. So you're using the plants to improve your soil and break it up. And buckwheat has a bit of a taproot, which really helps to penetrate down into the soil and open it up. Mm -hmm. So you have a combination of the roots and the green manure adding organic matter to the soil for a two-year process, and it can make a really big difference. And I've used it quite successfully. Fascinating. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, um, you're on seven o'clock. So uh, thank you very much, you two. Um, We've been doing this online broadcast um, and our Garden Masterclass YouTube channel since um, since the lockdown of April 2020. And you know, you, you were one of those people I've always wanted to get on from you know a fairly early date. Never quite got round to it. I think in the back of my mind was thinking, well, let's wait till that book comes out. You know, it's got to come out one day. Um, and uh, indeed, I, I'm glad we waited because it's it's great to be able to uh, promote the book. Um, and um, so it's available as a PDF, University of Chicago Press, make everything available both as hard copy um, and as, 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 as PDF versions. Uh, they're a fantastic publisher anyway. You can also buy my book, Hybrid, The Science and History of Plant Beating, also by University of Chicago Press. Couldn't resist sticking that one in. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, you guys. It's been a real honor having you on. Um, you know, you, 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 you've done great work and, uh, um, you know, fantastic pioneering. And uh, we hope... Many more, many more prairie planting into the future. Well, Noel, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Thank you. Indeed.
I second that. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Hilary. Bye -bye. Nice to meet you. All the best. All right.